welcome to Guildhall Library. My name is uh, Peter Ross. I'm Principal Librarian at the Library and I think this is the fifth time the Guild have been here and some people have been all five times, so well done if you've done that. Um, I just want to tell you something about Guildhall Library and its collections. Uh, so although we're a Library of London history, we have this amazing collection of books on wine and food. Um, so we have, of course we have the Guild of Food Writers collection, which is a fairly newly established and is, is growing. Um, but we have books from 1499, is our earliest cookery book, which of course is Italian, like all the best early cookery books. <laughs> um, but we have uh, books from the 16th, 17th, right up to the 21st centuries. We have a number of important collections, um, probably the most high profile is that of Elizabeth David. Mm -hmm. So that's her personal library of about 900 books that we bought from our house before that famous auction we were invited to go and buy her books which you may know had lots of uh, interesting annotations in them, which we preserved, um, which are, are fascinating. We also have, uh, more recently, uh, the library, or part of the library of Arabella Boxer, um, who's given us um, part of her library, and the rest will come after she's no longer with us, um, which includes her research notes for her articles for Vogue, etc. The latest collection we've received is that of Evelyn Rose, which arrived, it, I, was, I was told it was going to be about six boxes, it arrived in 20 boxes, uh, which my wonderful colleague uh, Chris has been spending about six months sorting out uh, and is now about to be catalogued. Um, so that includes her, um, her archive of research as well as um, her articles, her books, etc. So we have a, a number of interesting collections, but what we, what we don't have is enough people coming to look at them. Because essentially, a library of London history shouldn't necessarily have collections like that. They've evolved from the 19th century onwards. Two remarkable people in the 19th century, two men who were caterers to the city of London, collected antiquarian cookery books in the late 19th century and then gave them to Guildhall Library. And then the Cook's Guild gave us a collection. And then André Simon gave us a collection. And it's just grown. So we now have, I used to say 10,000 books on wine and food. Uh, I think it's now about 11,000 and growing. So we've decided to limit that collection in some way. So I've made the decision to limit it to food from the British Isles. That doesn't mean we wouldn't collect books uh, by important writers from uh, world food, but if I collected everything to do with food in the world, and you know it's the most popular subject in publishing, I would have 10 million books rather than 10,000. Um, so uh, it's really nice that you're um, here again, and I'd like to pass you on there to Hattie, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. I'm Hattie Ellis from the Guild and just wanted to say thank you very much to Peter and his team for welcome, welcoming us here. I think it's, this library is very much a home from home for us and I'd like to bring my sleeping bag and <laughs> stay here. Um, so thank you very much and thank you also very much to people who, who made food. Uh, it's a new thing for us to have lots of dishes and we're really grateful for everyone who, who took part in that. And this is <laughs> so we, it's a, a delight as well as um, a privilege to have our speaker here today, Ivan Day. Uh, probably lots of you in this room know him already, but uh, suffice it to say he's a world authority on historic food. Uh, behind exhibitions at the Getty Museum, the, the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, and many places in the UK. And uh, also the inspiration behind uh, Heston Blumenthal and Ashley Palmer Watts and Dinner. Um, and for many, many food historians. What's so special about Ivan is he he, he doesn't just sort of get it off the page. If he sees a spit, he goes and makes it and tries it. Um, if he hears the, the story about how a, a syllabub's made from a cow, he goes out and gets a cow. <laughs> so he, uh, his level of detail and knowledge is extraordinary. And, and the food, resulting food is delicious because historic food where does it come from and how do we know about it? And so we're very pleased that Ivan is going to uh, help us through to this other country of, of the past. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you.
I, I was having dinner at a Cambridge College on Friday uh, with a group of very eminent historians, who'll all be unnamed. Mm -hmm. And the gentleman sitting on my left was an emeritus professor of history, and his subject was the history of agriculture in antiquity. And he leaned over to me and he said, um, I don't know, I gather the true stoop so low as to get your hands dirty. <laughs> Meaning that I cooked, you see. And I said, well, you know, you're too old now, but if you'd, in your youth, you should have gone out in the field with a team of oxen and used a Roman plough. And you probably would have found out more about agriculture in antiquity than just sitting in a library. Um, so that, that puts me in my own context in a way. Um, we're sitting in a very august building with this remarkable collection of culinary literature. Um, they are, if you like, the score of the tunes. Um, I'm more interested in the instruments upon which the music was played, the objects, uh, the things that hung around in quite lowly and in quite lofty kitchens. So, I'm going to talk for 45 minutes, so I'm going to press this button on here so I don't overdo it. You might hear a funny noise in 45, that shuts me up. And um, I would like to talk about some of my obsessions. This is going to involve you handling some objects. I'm going to pass a few things around. I want to try and transfer some of the magic of some of these objects to you so that you can hold them in your hands. Um, so, first of all, one of my major interests, and I'm very wide scoping in my interest in food, is cooking using fire. And somewhere or other, we seem to have lost the little... Oh, here it is. Right. Okay. Um, the food we have now um, was all sorted out a long time ago. You know, most of the stuff we have inherited, our ancestors figured it all out. Nobody in this room was involved in inventing bread or cheese or any of those wonderful products, learning how to preserve hands. It was done millennia ago by these nameless people. All of the agricultural people who worked in Peru getting wild potatoes out of the ground and somehow transforming them by alchemy into something that was edible. Um, all of our staple foods um, were all discovered in the Neolithic period. There's not one that we've added since, whether it was maize, sorghum, rye, cassava, rice, wheat, you know, barley, oats. All of those were grown from wild plants by nameless people a long time ago. So there's a tremendous amount of history that is unknown. And they also invented a lot of the cooking and culinary techniques too, as well as inventing or producing the products from a horticulture and agricultural point of view. And of course, there's a bit of a hunter-gatherer in every single one of us, really. I, I have vegetarian friends who smell bacon cooking, or they come to my kitchen and they see, you know, a piece of, like, fillet of beef going around on a spit. And I say, look, I know you're only a microsecond away from converting to being a carnivore, <laughs> because it's inbuilt in us. And this, this approach to cooking is something which is slowly coming back. You know, there are more and more restaurants in London that have a grill. I've been doing it for decades because I've always lived in houses where I've got big fireplaces. This isn't my fireplace. This is a fireplace in a medieval kitchen at Gainsborough Hall. And it's still, it's still from a documentary that I worked on for Korean Broadcasting Service a couple of years ago. And we actually got this kitchen working. And um, I want you to note one or two things. Can you see this little skewer here? Um, well, we'll have a look at that later on. But what we're doing here is we're roasting using um, these things, which were called cob irons and a spit. This is a salmon, and it's being roasted using lards. These are hazel bonds, which are tied on with fillet, which is a type of tape. And of course, this is described in a recipe, a number of them. So, you know, figured out it's stuffed with um, pickled herring, anchovies, and some thyme and some butter, and some um, you, you baste it with verjuice, you know, sort of sour <coughs> grape or, or crab apple juice. And um, if, if you don't put those things on it, it'll just collapse into the um, the, the um, dripping pan underneath. And these are described. These kind of techniques are actually they do turn up in manuscripts and in one or two printed 
And it's always my sort of ambition when I see them, I've got to do this, I've got to try it out. And then you do it and you think, God, these people were really clever, you know. They, if you don't do that, the whole thing just falls off the spit, of course. And um, in the search of, of trying to do this for nearly half a century, because I started very young, um, I've tried to equip my kitchen uh, with equipment like this. Um, this, some of you might recognize as an engraving in the 1570 opera of um, a Cuoco Segreto, the, the great Italian cook called Bartolomeo Scappi. And this is his molin, Molinello de Arosto. It's a, it's a machine for roasting little birds. Well, you think, my God, where would you find one of those? Well, about 15 years ago, <laughs> I found one. <laughs> and I restored it, and I use it about two or three times a year. Usually when I have Italian guests coming, and they're quite amazed by this. And it is remarkable. It's got a, a little sort of feature here, which kind of makes sure that the, the spit rotates at an even pace all the time. Um, and this is another one that I use much more. This is run by a weight, like a, a weight that hangs down. The weight is a cannonball. So I tell, tell people, look, this, you're getting the only cannonball roasted leg of mutton in England this weekend. <coughs> and then there are other machines. This is a, a beautiful 19th century thing you wind up at the clock, and it will turn your meat around um, vertically. And it was designed for the small cottage or a chamber in like the city of London where you only had a little hearth. So it means you can roast a big bird like a turkey or a capon or a, or a goose um, using one of these things and it rotates like this three times and goes around the other way. So for instance, when you want to roast your Christmas goose in front of a small chamber fire um, and you sit the potatoes underneath it and let the fat drip over them, and they roast, that's they're the only real English roasted potatoes because they've actually cooked absolutely brown from the radiant heat coming from the fire. So th these are the sorts of things that I explore. This is another type of skewer, can you see it? It's flat. Um, we'll come to skewers in a moment. But that's being turned by this thing which is sometimes called a bottle jack. It was invented in the 1780s um, by a man called William Fremantle. And uh, it became the most popular way of roasting meat for poor people who lived in cottages. Um, and you'll find loads of these around in antique shops because so many of them were made that they still survive. The more complicated ones, like the Italian one, that's the only one I know in existence, the one that I've actually got operating in my kitchen at the moment. And you know, the books are really useful. Some of you might know this. This is a remarkable. Um, book of professional cookery published in, in Paris um, by uh, a two very important French chefs who'd been living in London during the Franco-Prussian War and they had absorbed some of the techniques used in the great London uh, establishments, the, the, the great houses in the West End for roasting. So, you know, if you want to know how to roast some larks, if you ever dare to commit such a crime, um, or some partridges, or a couple of capons, look at this. This is the technology that was being developed in the 19th century. And one of the most common ways of keeping your meat still was using what was called a cradle spit, or um, sometimes, um, some call it, sometimes called an umbrella spit, actually, or a basket spit and the meat is contained within it. And this is the other technique, you've got a thing called a hold fast. So for instance, that's in my kitchen, roasting a very large joint of beef. It's massive, it's about 25 pounds, that joint. And that cooks in about four hours in front of the fire. It's quicker than it would be in an oven, actually. And um, so that's a cradle or a basket spit. And it's fantastic, you can just get on with another job while this is turning around. And this is a, this is a leg of mutton. Can you see the hold fast? There? So the thing is, spits are not round, they're, they've got a square section, which means that they grip the meat. A lot of people think they're round, and if you'd have a round one, the meat would just sort of stay still and the spit will go round. So you have to have little features like this. And what's actually cooking underneath these, believe it or not, is the Yorkshire pudding, mm -hmm. um, which was originally cooked underneath the meat. And the meat was mutton, not beef, originally in the 18th century. 
Um, above my fireplace, there are all these instruments of torture. The, these are all gridirons, and they're marvellous pieces of folk art, really, wonderful sort of blacksmiths, inventive expressions of ingenuity. That one there rotates, simple as anything, and some of them have little little kind of reservoirs to catch the gravy. <coughs> Now, I've got an amazing collection of the early cookery equipment dating from the 15th century right through to the First World War. But there are lots of things that are old and you can't use them. For instance, there are hardly any surviving cook's knives. We've got rusted away sort of things that have been dragged out of the tenements, you know, sometimes. Um, the only way forward is to actually have replicas made. And that's very skilled cutler made these. Some of you who know anything about Italian food history will recognize these. This is the complete set of nines that were illustrated by Bartolomeo Scarpi, who also provided the illustration of the Moninola de Arosto earlier on. And if you look at these, if I flash back, you can see that um, they're all there. And the voyage of discovery with these is quite extraordinary because First of all, let's take these two up here. We can tell from the caption that they're for opening oysters. When the cutler made them, he wasn't sure about that, and he unfortunately gave them a very sharp edge, which they wouldn't have had. They would have been a blunt edge. Um, and I said, oh, goodness me, can you take the edge off? Because they're going to be deadly, you know, trying to stick that in an oyster and then yanking it through. And um, so he did, and they're absolutely amazing. They're the best oyster knives I've ever, ever used because you can work that little curved tip in much better than the sort of modern ones that you shove in and then just flick it round and it pops open. Um, some of the, the larger ones were actually more for butchering carcasses, you know, cutting them up into, into joints that were useful to the cook. And you get things like, um, where is it? There's a, um, th this, there's one here that is for, yes, for cutting tarts. You know, it's for actually cutting tarts up into slices. So I've been playing around with those for a long time. But can you see the, this little um, skewer here, which is the one that we used for the um, very first image of the meat on the spit? Well, I was in a, um, a market in northern Italy in Aosta, and I bought 20 of them, which were almost certainly, somebody looked at them and said, yeah, they're, they're 17th century. And they'd just been in some farmhouse and somebody had kind of clear out, and there was a little box of them. I bought them for about 15 euros, you know. <laughs> and the extraordinary thing, no, they're so old, most people think, oh, you can't use them. They're actually, they're so beautifully made, they've been so well looked after, because they've spent maybe a couple of hundred years covered in grease, which has preserved them. Um, so the ones you actually saw, original 17th century Italian ones. I've got no problem with using a lot of this equipment. The Museum of London, for instance, would think I'm crazy. But it, some of it's so robust, it's very difficult to damage it. Um, Scarpi also um, does this wonderful drawing of this thing that the, the cook wears at his belt, which is something we stopped doing. Um, and this continued, you know, through the Renaissance period <coughs> into the um, Mannerist and Baroque periods, and into the, the 20th century. A lot of early 20th century chefs who manned the great hotels here in London used, if you see photographs of them, you look at their side, and they've got half a dozen knives in, in their pockets. Now they had something else usually, and um, I've put a set of them over there, which are larding pins. And I brought a lovely 18th century set in a lovely olive wood case. And some of them are so tiny that they were sewing back fat strips through things like partridges and small game birds. So later on, you can have a, have a look at those. So in terms of, of, of knives, they, they're the knives that were used in the kitchen. But there's also an amazing culture of knives that are used to dine with, to eat with. And um, B. Wilson, who I'm sure most of you know here, has written the book recently, Consider the Fork, which is a wonderful book. Um, and some of the things she mentions in the book, I'm going to sort of show you and let you hold and feel their magic. And um, 
the, 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 on the left hand side you can see a 16th century Venetian knife and a very early fork um, which are really fancy pantsy basically you know um, with these coral handles all these gilt decorations these belong to somebody who is immensely wealthy. I used these in an exhibition in Minneapolis about four years ago, which I curated called Supper with Shakespeare, which looked at food culture in Britain in the 16th and 17th century. These are English, and these are high status eating knives, but these are bride knives. A husband gave his wife a bride knife, or a set of them, um, and it was a symbol of fidelity. So, like the wedding ring, it, it meant eternity, and she would die using them for the rest of her life. Um, and they were usually in a wonderful stump work or embroidered scabbard, and she would wear them with her pocket, which is the old name for what you might call a purse. In America, they call them pocketbooks, and that's a wonderful survival. And um, do you notice that all of these have got points on them? Um, the reason being that you didn't have a fork, so you needed a sharp edge to spear um, your meat. I've got, I've got a tuna knife here. Can you see how pointed it is? No fork. So you cut your meat and then you can actually spear it and eat it off your knife. That was one way of eating. When um, the fork comes in, uh, can you see the points on these? These are wonderful. These are ivory handled. This one has got a, por a portrait in ivory of Queen Elizabeth on it. I'll pass that one around. Now be careful because it is a little sharp. But have a look at the handle. And um, it's a, it's a, be very careful with it because, as I say, don't stab yourself with it. Um, but this is black because it was found in the Um But it is a, it's a Tudor knife, rather like these. These are the kings and queens of England um, from the 1590. Oh, sorry, from the 1610, I think, because James the First is off there somewhere. Um, that knife there. Um, it's got a round end. I've, I've kind of disguised it with some butter because the fork had come in by then. So if you see early knives that have got a round end, then you know that this is before the... Um, sorry, this is after the fork. Now, two more that are coming round. If you could have a quick look at them. Uh, can you see this? This is total magic. Um, this is an eating knife which was carried in a little scabbard by a child in the 1570s. Um, and it is just one of the most endearing objects that I've ever seen in my life. So that's, that's Tudor as well. So just be careful, put the point down like that because I, I'm worried about your eyes. <laughs> and the, the earliest collection of recipes we really have in Britain was a sort of roll that was written out in the 1390s by the master cooks of, of Richard II, and this is a knife, an eating knife, and it's a peasant, a peasant eating knife from about 1400. Um, it, it really is very simple, but very beautiful. You know, the rich had all these fancy things. The poor had something called folk art, you know, which um, is very important to understand. So fire and, and blades. The other obsession I want to talk about is English regional food. I live in the Lake District, where we have a fossil food culture, which is now extinct, actually. Um, <laughs> but this is really a case study, an object, so that even the most basic and simple foods had um, a nomenclature, a language, and also a, a kind of systematic uh, approach to making them, which is often quite astonishing. What is on this plate is a piece of an extinct oat cake, which was made in the Lake District. It had a number of names. One was clap cake, because you, you clapped it out with your hands. Another one was haver cake, because it was made with oats, and the Norse word for oats was haver. Um, and haver cake was baked all over the north of England, particularly in wet areas where wheat didn't do very well. And in order to bake it, you need an amazing amount of equipment. Um, and what you end up with is something that looks like cardboard and it tastes like cardboard. <laughs> it's the most over-engineered food in the history of mankind. It's actually delicious, but let me take you through um, the technique. 
You rarely see these anywhere at all now in the north of England, but they were once very common. And this in Cumberland, Westmoreland dialect is called a biaxtian, a bake stone. And they were made from stone. There are quarries with names like Bakestone Gully, where they actually removed the, the stone to make them. And you basically, there were various kinds. Um, if you didn't have a, a backstand, you had one of these things, which is called a girdle. Okay, that's still a name mm -hmm. that survived. But you put the girdle over another piece of equipment, which was called a brandreth, which is like a little tripod. And you made your clap cake by mixing boiling water with oatmeal, very fine oatmeal. And then you use this. This is called a backboard um, or a bakeboard. And it was described in the 1690s by Celia Fiennes, who says that they always had a little concave dip in them. If you put a rolling pin on that, it wouldn't work because it, it deliberately goes in. And how you used it was you drove out your um, dough as thin as a, as a poppadom, if you could do it. And this is an English poppadom rather than an English chapati, you know, because it's going to be baked crisp. So in order to make this, you need either a, a backstian, a girdle and brandreth, you need a backboard. And the trouble is, when you, you clapped it out, so you've got this repetitive strain injury called have a cake hand after a while. <laughs> and, and some joker invented these pins, which resemble others that made a particular type of biscuit, but they found that if you used a pin like this, it didn't stick, because you're rolling out porridge. You're literally rolling out thick porridge. And it doesn't stick if you use one of these. And then it's such a fragile thing, you have to get it off the backboard with one of these things, which is called a thigh ball. When you put it on your biaxtian or your girdle, you have to scrape this thing underneath it. It's called a spittle, in order to stop it from sticking. And then, when it's cooked on both sides, there's one cooking on a girdle there, can you see? It's then transferred to a brander, which is this thing here, which dries it out, and then you put it on an easel which is called a have a cake maiden. <laughs> so you've got about ten processes before you end up with your sheet of hardboard. You know? <laughs> now, this is just one of a family of now extinct breads that were common throughout northern England. I think I'm the only person in Britain who goes to the trouble of making it. <laughs> and despite the huge investment in getting all the stuff together, I mean, it is worth it, it's delicious. And if you make it with a roller, it looks a bit like this. Now, there is another type which is soft, and this looks exactly like a chamois leather, and of course it tastes just like a <laughs> chamois leather. And you go to an equal amount of trouble with an equal number of different gadgets in order to make this. Now, I could talk to you all evening about just this bread, I'm not going to. But what we have is this submerged part of the iceberg, really, which is what I'm interested in, which is our forgotten food material culture, the culture of objects, which we've forgotten how to use. Um, and they supplement the recipe so much sometimes, you'll see that shortly, um, that it's a joy to actually recreate these. By the way, this is not a washing thing, you know, you hang up your washing. This is called a have a cake fleek. <laughs> it's actually got a name. There's a number of names for it, actually. But, um, and you hang them up, and they will become crisp in about 24 hours. Uh, otherwise, this is a soft version. So this is more like, a, can you see all the little holes in it? This is more like a crumpet or a pikelet, because it's been leavened with some, <coughs> with some yeast. And of course, this is more closely related to Yorkshire um, and Lancashire oat cakes. Um, I'm particularly interested in pastry, and this is an area which, um, again, a lot has been forgotten about. And um, I'm going to pass something round which is really quite special. Um, I'm coming back to one of my favourite authors, um, Bartolomeo Scarpi. And what you see sitting on an actual page of the Scarpi is this thing here. Can you see there's two of them there, actually? These are pastry jaggers from about 1570. So this is a 
This is a, um, a pastry jagger which was being used when Titian was still painting. You know, um, it's um, a Renaissance Italian uh, culinary object. I know of, I own two, and there's two others. There's one in the British Museum, and there's one in the V&A which has its wheel missing. And I think the two I own are the only complete ones in Britain, as far as I know. Um, but can you see the wheel at the end? Well, that's for cutting. You can cut. Um, you can make a ravioli or whatever with it, but this is for going around the, the, the torta pan and trimming off the, the pastry. And um, if you look at it very carefully, you'll see that there's a little duck. There's a little duck with its bill that's holding the wheel, which is a very, very, very common design. So these things are, are actually very beautiful. Um, and um, some of them I'm a bit cautious about using, that one particularly, it's of such antiquity and it's so rare that I don't do it. I've got lots of others. And I'm going to pass another one round. Now this is probably the most beautiful thing you will see today, full stop, period, as they say in America. <laughs> um, this is a pastry jagger, it's a Dutch one, from about 1630. And what you've got to do is look very carefully at the member of the guild of, of, of bakers, the Dutch Guild. Um, we're in the city of London, surrounded with all these amazing livery companies. But here you actually see a baker with a rolling pin and his guild uniform on. And hanging from the rolling pin is a sheet of pastry. So sometimes they tell a story which is more about their utility. It's also about the, the kind of story. Um, with that, that is one of my most favorite objects in the universe, actually. You know. Um, and uh, the extraordinary thing is this, that we see these, this is a bit of Victorian illustrations of pastry, and they look great. I mean, look at this thing here with its little, it's a bit like a, a, a maypole dance on the village green, you know, with these little um, strands of parsley which have been threaded into s strips of um, linen thread by some poor kitchen servant, you know with nimble fingers. But the decorations on the actual top, um, I've brought some what are called um, pie boards. They press these out of pastry. There's a whole bunch of them over there, which you can see. And, um, but this thing here, this pie, is actually a pie that originated in Strasbourg. And it was used for conveying foie gras and truffles to other parts of Europe. And the baker would have to make a very good hand-raised pie and put a lid on it, bake it, and it mustn't crack because they use these as methods of transport. It's like a can. And in order to make sure that it baked really well and didn't, because a lot of pies will sink, they actually collapse as the butter or the fat in the pastry gets hot. It sinks and you end up with the thing that's shaped like a bell. So what the poor old baker had to do was with a pair of these, can you see I've got a sort of pair of nippers here, I'll send these round. What they actually did is they went around their pie and nipped a herringbone pattern all the way round. Can you see it alternating like that? And um, what happens is you increase the surface area of the pie so much, maybe a thousand percent, and when you put it in the hot oven, it, it cooks that little tiny bit on the outside much more quickly, which acts as a kind of reinforcement. Now, I experimented with this and it works. It stops it from burning out and it stops it from cracking, which is essential because the contents are very valuable and you're selling them far afield. And then what they often used to do was to get a pastry brush and run an egg wash around each alternate um, little layer of the herringbone. Can you see so you get a dark brown going around? Now, um, do you want to quickly run over there? And can you see there's a little copper, tiny little copper mold on that table? Yeah. Um, if you could pan that around. I'm passing around. They soon got fed up of doing this, so they started Sorry. making molds. That's it, yeah. They started making molds. And um, th you can see how that story, using a little nipper, a little paint stew crimper, then defines a design for an actual way of doing it where you're saving yourself a lot of time and therefore a lot of money. Um, now, that's it. I brought that one because I've struggled down from the Lake District with a suitcase for all these things. <laughs> so I brought a very small one, but it'll give you the idea in any way. 
And there we have one. And uh, there, there are the tools, two different ones, and there is... These are made using a pie board. We can have a look at some of those later on. And of course, my battery could de cuisine is uh, quite um, unusual in that I've got a lot of these things um, which make these extraordinary things that they really did make in it. When you see these illustrations, Peter's put loads of Mrs. Beaton kind of chromolithographs out and things. And when you first see this, oh, they didn't make food like that. They did, actually. And they did do it. And they went to that trouble. It was very servant based. You have a lot of very skilled people who could do work. We wouldn't do it now. It's too, too fussy. Um, that, that one, as well as being a pie mold to make a pie in the form of a kraut, it also allows you to make a sockler, which is a, an ice base for ice cream in the form of a kraut. Um, so when you're knocking up your pie, you basically use the tools, you know, like the little crimper things to make your pattern around there. You press out your leads and other decorations, and then you bung it in the oven. And uh, you know, some of them are beautiful. Absolutely so. And that's what you get at the end. And there is actually a, 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 a chromolithograph. On, can you see it? On, no, it's a little black and white print on the end, which is just like that. Um, and um, these were made, and they were made very skillfully by these people, and baked in ovens like the one behind, you can see, which is in, that's my kitchen, by the way, at Christmas. And another one. Of course, the very posh ones, you needed to put a garniture on them with, with atelier skewers and crayfish and truffles, you know, a couple of hundred quid's worth of Perigord truffles. And there's another 300 quid's worth inside the pie, usually, you know, in today's money. Okay, now, another enthusiasm I have is for this. Now, this means two things. Flummery was actually a kind of synonym, if you like, for a type of blancmange. But it also could mean something like some frippery, something that is um, just fun, but not necessarily of any great gastronomic value. And um, the first flummery moulds, um, we've got a lot from the 18th century. This is an early 19th century one. Flummery was originally made by soaking oatmeal in water and letting it ferment for about four days. <laughs> and you end up with something, you boil it, and you end up with something that looks like wallpaper paste. In fact, it tastes like wallpaper paste as well. <laughs> um, but if you set it a bit longer, you could put it in a wet mold and turn it out, and you got this, which is a dairy product that is really the forerunner of blancmange, except you're, you're actually setting it with oats rather than gelatine or whatever. Um, and during the 18th century, um, there was a craze for making these molded desserts. It's a bit like a panna cotta, really, you know, probably not as nice. Some of them, some of them are okay. They tended to be flavoured with floral waters like rose water and orange flower water. But in Staffordshire in, in the 1750s, uh, one of the Wedgwood family, uh, the forerunner of Josiah working at the big house in Burston in the Midlands, started producing these little molds. They're made of salt glazed stoneware. These are from about 1750, and they were marketed as flummery molds. And various people acted as agents all over the country selling them. And one or two people actually published recipes. Very famous Mrs. Raphael of Manchester was probably an agent for selling these, and her book is full of recipes for making, for instance, the sun. This is Jean Monge, it's yellow blancmange, flavoured with sever orange. Um, but what fun these things are. And that's turned out from a 1750s mould. Um, and you get, this is one of her recipes, this is uh, Elizabeth Raphael, to make moon and stars and jelly. Now, in order to do that now, you've got to find a moon mould and a star mould. But what you make with them is kind of just so <laughs> amazingly delightful. You know, all the sort of charm of 18th century aesthetic cultures wrapped up on that little plate. And these are very common, actually. This was the most popular. These are tiny. These are from 1750. And they're almost as, as thil, thin as an eggshell. And they turn out these little blancmange fish, which, of course, you have to sort of transform into goldfish by gilding them with gold <laughs> Some of them are very strange. There was a, a taste of classical um, motifs. 
And this is a bucranion, except it's not an ox, it's a, it's a ram. So it's a, in fact, it's an Egyptian motif, if you look at the lotus at the top. And the, what, you, what it makes is basically a cameo. Cam what about this one? This is, a, this is like um, a bit of classical, it's a gemstone, it's a cameo, but it's edible. And this tradition, people don't realize it, but during the 18th century, they were making things like this, and it carried on. So, for instance, when Queen Victoria marries Prince Albert, a whole series of these were brought out, different ones, to commemorate the marriage. So, you could celebrate the royal marriage in your dessert course <laughs> with a cameo portrait of your monarch. You know Now, how you would feel about eating, I'm not totally sure about it, but, um, it, it seems so strange to us, but you know, there's these little avenues of food culture that I really like to explore. Mrs. Raphael gives a recipe for something called a Solomon's Temple, and this is a Solomon's Temple mold, again from about 1750. And there are various forms of this. I use a different one to actually make this thing, but you're told, you're told to put flowers in it to stop these from wobbling too much when the poor waiter has to take them <laughs> to the table. Can you imagine going up the um, kitchen stairs with those? Really? I made this man do it, he was an actor, and it was absolutely <laughs> hilarious. And then Wedgwood comes along at the end of the 18th century and produces some of the most stunning food molds in the history of the culinary arts. This is a Wedgwood, um, what's known as a Queensware mould, creamware, which is in the form of a basket of fruit. And the colours have been done using the kind of vegetable colours and flavourings that they used at that period. And it looks a bit thick and inedible, but it isn't actually. It's very light <coughs> and absolutely beautiful to look at. And then the other thing that I love doing is by using objects and looking at them carefully and comparing them is getting rid of a lot of food myths. Like, for instance, in Central Europe, this is known as a Kugelhopf mold, and it makes, a, or a Bunt mold in America, you would probably say. Um, in England, it was known as a Turk's cap mold because it resembled a turkey. <laughs> and if you go to Vienna or to Salzburg, they will tell you that this originated at the time when um, Leopold I was fighting the Turks back from the gates of Vienna. Rather like the croissant story, you know, that it celebrated the Ottoman um, <coughs> invasions and their defeat. Um, so there is a beautiful, this is actually a very early one that does date from that period, from, from about 1690. And it is Austrian, and it's hand chased. The, the craftsman who made it was really very clever. These are very common, but most of them are more recent. This is a really early one. But unfortunately, this polychrome, um, can you see this is a, um, an alabaster carving, and it shows Mary Magdalene in the house of Martha, and she is wash, washing the feet of Christ. And look, Martha, who's the hostess, is, is coming in. This was made in 1510. She's coming in with a kugelhop, you know, saying, <laughs> put your hand up if you believe this silly story that happened, you know, another 120 years later. And what's amazing is, look, these, these little twisted bread um, rolls, which are quite common in Central Europe, is actually doubling up as, as Mary Magdalene's halo. I've never seen such a brilliant culinary use of a, <laughs> as a bit of religious iconography. You know. um, so that, that sometimes, you know a little bit about this, um, you can... Now Robin Weir is, is here, I know he's a long-standing member of this guild and also a very dear and long-standing friend who has had a lifelong interest in um, Mrs. Marshall, who was this famous cookery teacher in the end of the 19th, early 20th century. And in fact, Robin put me onto this photograph many years ago, and it actually shows her teaching, a group. that's Mrs. Marshall, look at those, I wish I had some of those. <laughs> and here she's, she's got three rather shy looking servant girls, you know, um, and she's demonstrating in the most beautiful way, an incredibly well prepared kit on the table. But look here, she's using one of these things, that's mine. And this is called a succe mold. 
And that's the ice cream one, and that's the jelly version. And there's an illustration from it. And there's a photograph, actually, from the time of one of these things. And um, she also marketed all the ingredients that went into it, including the dreadful colours, you know. <laughs> so using very similar um, colours, which were made from coal tar, um, <laughs> I tried to re reproduce one of these, her favourite dish, because it turns up time and time and time again. Now, this is easy. This is 19th century food, and there's so much kit that has survived that you can do it. Um, although you'll pay a lot of money, you know, for some of these um, these um, these tools. Um, but look, she used to advertise her um, stuff, and. You can put together by just spending a couple of Saturdays in Portobello Road, you can actually find some of these things. Look at um, this, for instance. This is called a ballet. How the hell do you use it? Well, here you go. Um, this is a dish where it's, it's awful, actually. Um, <laughs> you get a nugget of foie gras. You line your mould with little cutouts of what's called savoury custard in different colours. You put the foie gras in one, and then you pour into the little funnel at the top some clear aspic jelly, which sets it. And you end up with a kind of one of those Victorian paperweights, you know, with the middle of the ori colours in it. And then you, you lay them out on a bed of aspic jelly with tarragon and then um, artichoke hearts, which have got little flageolet beans in them. It's very typical. Now, that took me and one other person seven hours. <laughs> and this is the other thing I find extraordinary, is to, to do it, to find out just what the works. Now, any restaurant, somebody had ordered that in a restaurant, and seven hours later you produced it. In fact, it was longer than that, because it has to set overnight, you know. And it just shows how much our food culture has changed, really, over um, the past century. And even a little funnel, you know, to fill them in. And then, of course, um, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with these. These are the sort of crazy Isambard <coughs> Kingdom Brunel style culinary inventions of English coppersmiths in the 19th century. Funnily enough, these are illustrations from French cookery books, because they thought English moulds were just fantastic, you know. And this one here um, is called a Macedoine mould, and it's got this sort of liner which you change to the outside so it stays still. And what you do is you pour into this space a clear maraschino jelly, and then you let it set on some ice. You can see that sort of happening. Um, hang on. And then you put some warm water in that and pull that out, and you have a hollow, which you can then put a, a still life of fruit in. And this, this, is a, this is Apsley House, the Duke of Wellington's. A couple of years ago, in 2015, it was the uh, you know, bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo. And I did a thing there um, using some recipes from a banquet, which included a Macedonian jelly like this. And this is the Prussian service that the King of Prussia gave to the Duke of Wellington. And I'm very lucky because museums let me put food on things like that. You know? And this is the Portuguese. A certu de tarte, a great thing. If you've been to Apsley House Dining Room, you'll see it there. And again, you get these wonderful illustrations of some of these other ridiculous things. Um, this is probably the most over-engineered jelly <coughs> in the history of the world. It's called a Belgrave. And <laughs> basically, you, you put that into the mould, you pour clear jelly around it, and then when it's set, you have to remove these tubes by pouring water into them, warm water, and you twist them and they come out. And if you look carefully, can you see there's a little hole at the bottom? Well, there's a little tube that goes all the way down, so that when you screw them, the air can get in, so that it doesn't rip the jelly. And then you can pour something else in and let it set. Look at this one here. And that, that's your Macedon jelly. So, um, I have a lot of fun playing with these things. Um, this is flummery too, and some of the, the great sort of ancient um, cream dishes that used to be consumed in this city, um, just up the river from here, was um, this remarkable um, pottery, very early pottery that made posset pots like this. Um, and 
this one is actually in America, it's in a collection. This is one of the earliest I've ever seen from the 1630s when these things started to really appear. And of course, this is for consuming a hot thing called a posse, which was an alcoholic custard. And basically you let it settle so that the alcohol separated from the custard. So you got a liquid at the bottom and you got a froth on the top, which was called the grace, which you ate with a spoon. And then you sucked the liquid. It's not, it's not like a teapot, you don't pour, you suck. So it's like a straw and you like that, and you pass it along to the next person, you know. And you say, I can't let the diphtheria epidemic. <laughs> and they also made them out of glass. And the, 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 the antiquarians and the, and the glass dealers have always called these posset pots. But can you see, this type of glass is known as chrysled glass. And it's made from a very primitive kind of soda glass. And sometimes this happens to it after a, a number of years. But it will also happen if you pour something hot into it. If you pour hot liquid into one of these early posset pots, they would have cracked all this would have happened. They were not designed for that. This is not a posset glass. That's a posset pot. This is a syllabub glass, which was a cold dish. And again, it separated into liquid below and, and cream above and was used a bit like this. So there's one. Can you see the liquid? Just suck up that and you get it. And then you, you have that at the end. You eat the grace with a spoon. And this is an individual serving. It's a small one rather than a communal one. Communal one went out of fashion for probably quite <laughs> obvious reasons. And then they stopped having the spout and they started making them more like a jelly glass. But can you see the funnel? It's like a trunk. That's me to shut up, actually. But I'll, I'll just I'll keep going for a little while. You don't mind me. <laughs> so basically, you've got a trumpet end. And what you do is you make this separately with a, with a birch and whisk and then you float it on some sweet wine. And because it's got the bell, that doesn't sink down into the liquid. So this is the sort of next stage in the evolution of these things. Now again, with my dear friend Robin in mind, you know, um, poaches territory a little tiny bit. Um, although I don't know whether you know this, Robin, this is a photograph that's terribly blurred because I took it illegally in the imperial collection in Vienna. And it's the Emperor of Austria's ice kitchen in the Royal, um, the Imperial Palace in, in Vienna, um, probably in the early 20th century. And can you see this chap is stirring some ice cream in a sorbetier? And these are molds that are just about to be filled. And you can see lots of equipment in the background. And they're all standing on wood, wooden trestles because they're working in the, in the absolute dungeons of the building where it's really cold. And um, the, I've had a lot of fun sometimes with Robin. We've actually done a lot of this together. Um, but it's, this is sort of 19th century. It's a bit like, you know, Christmas cracker novelties, edible ones, you know. I mean, who would ever dream up now an Egyptian obelisk and made of ice cream or a cucumber? You know. um, and you get these advertisements, you know, for asparagus and cucumber. So, you know, th th these are hanging around still. They're difficult to find, but there is a lovely cucumber mold. There is the recipe, and that's what it, and what it looks like. <laughs> Not terribly appetizing. Um, and then it's quite revelatory when you actually turn out one of these large ice. This is a water ice made in a mold that creates a basket of flowers. Aesthetically, it's, it's actually evolved from the Wedgwood. You know, the one I showed you with the basket, the same kind of, I kept on bouncing down the centuries. And that's what that produces. And if you leave them in a bucket of ice and salt for three or four hours, you have to wrap the mold up in brown paper and seal it so the saline solution can but when it comes out, if it's in the summer, when a lot of these are certain, there's a high humidity, within about five minutes, you get this remarkable rhyme frost forming on the outside. Look at this little <coughs> raspberry tart, unbelievable, gherkin. Mm -hmm. um, and they're very hard. In, in Italy, in the late 17th century, we get the first descriptions of these, and they're called pezziduri, hard pieces. 
And in the 19th century, they would often form a centerpiece for a dinner. So when you got to the dessert course, which might be two and a half hours later, <laughs> they hadn't completely, they, was, they were just right to eat, because eating ice cream when it's ice cold is, is a full hour of um, And then, of course, um, you get, this is a great story. This is an 18th century design for a, an ice cream mold to actually make an asparagus dip. <laughs> And this is Mrs. Marshall's wonderful chromolithograph, and basically, this is what you can do with these things. Um, so that's ice, and um, spice is the next thing, which has always been an obsession of mine. And I know Jill Norman is his <coughs> wonderful um, a book about this. Um, gingerbread um, is something I'm really interested in, and in fact. Um, where is it? Um, I want to, there's a big thick mold over there. Can you see? On it's the, thick, the, most, the one at the back that's really high. No, just on the table. This one? Yeah. Yeah, could you send that? Yeah. yeah. With this one, on one side you've got a gingerbread man, who we all know about, but this is the most sartorially elegant one you'll ever see. And if you turn it around, you'll notice that that forgotten person, the gingerbread lady on the back, we don't hear much about these days. I say equal rights to all gingerbread people, personally. <laughs> and um, we've got both of them there. Um, <coughs> these little gingerbreads, which are exquisite, I made them from a, a 1630s mold. Can you see the lutenist and the harpist? But, but instead of being flavoured with gingerbread, it's flavoured with licorice, grains of paradise, and aniseed. So they mix the spice a bit. But look at this painting. I don't know if you can see at the back, but this is a, a vendor in months leading up to Christmas in the Netherlands. And she has got salt card um, and uh, there's some medlars somewhere there, which are autumnal fruits. And you've got gingerbreads, which were important in the Netherlands for the, the feast of St. Nicholas on the 5th of December. So, in the background, there's no leaves on the tree, so you know we know what time of year it is. But look very carefully just there. I'm going to show you a, um, a close-up. Can you see there? There's a, you've got the mole that's coming around now. And another friend of mine is in the room. It's um, Julian Riley, who has spent a lifetime um, looking at paintings, taught me a lot. And it's when you confuse these different disciplines together, really, of, you know, the art historian, somebody who actually, you know, knows a little bit about objects in the past, that we can learn so much. But I was quite shocked. Um, I was involved in an exhibition at the Fitzwilliam a couple of years ago, and they asked me to choose an object in the museum, and I chose this painting, because I suddenly realised I actually owned the model, but unbeknown, to anyone, when you turn it around, there is a whole family of little gingerbread people. And um, for some reason, these figures always remind me of the, the, the Merry Wives of Windsor, you know, Mistress Quickly and Falstaff. And uh, I always imagined that I could get Shakespeare to do a caption competition, you know, looking at these guys. And so you don't have to read that, but. Um, and then you get um, often thinking of this city, often you've got gingerbreads being sold at big events, you know, like coronations on the street in the form of the royal arms. And um, do you want to go and grab this too? There's a little one that's got the royal arms on it, the smallest one, that's it. And then there's a big chunky one. Can you see I'm hovering my red light over it there to sell? This one. No, no, just at the end. Of, that's it, yeah. If you could pass the little one around. Now, this is very serious, you know, it's the sort of thing you might see over a doorway, you know, over a sort of um, court of justice or something. Um, but these, the main target for these was children. Children used to, you know, beg their mothers and fathers to buy them a gingerbread, say, at a frost fair, just like they might bother you to have an expensive pair of trainers nowadays. And I'm sending you two moulds which show you the royal arms. One is the kind of adult version, and the other one, is one that's been designed to appeal to children because it's also almost Disneyland in the kind of cartoon 
character. One is from the early 18th century, the other one is a 19th century one. Um, and finally, finally, um, I'm probably best known for what I do with um, the history of sugar. And this is a little exhibition earlier this year that I was involved as a guest curator. This is Detroit. And I was taking a group of curators around the exhibition and volunteers to train them in order to, so they could lead visitors through. And suddenly a bunch of school kids came bursting in the room and somebody said, see that man there, he made this. And I got I'm absolutely swamped by all these wonderful little children, you know. And they come from some of the most deprived parts of Detroit. And they were just so captivated by this. And there was a little boy somewhere at the back who was a little bit naughty. And he said, can I have that man's head? I want to bite it off. He said. <laughs> so this is a sort of sugar sculpture, um, you know, from, from Versailles, actually, which um, we recreated for the, this great exhibition, which is called The End of the Monument. So um, it's just uh, my work gets me in all sorts of unhealthy places. And um, just to end with a, a sour note, this is me being thrown my teddy bear out of the pram. Um, there was a television program recently, I think it was called the... Sweetmakers, which went out. Some of you must have seen it. Yes. You probably don't watch television. <laughs> and um, a group of confectioners were actually um, told to reconstruct the way that things used to be done in the past. And I just had to turn it off after five minutes because I thought, oh no, this is awful. And um, so the same company a year ago said, Ivan, would you teach some of our people to make a twelfth cake and ornament it? I said, sure. They came up and I made them something like this. And they decided not to use it for some reason. And, um, I thought, would you honestly, you're only interested in seeing people fail because they had these professionals making things. And of course, they couldn't do it, make great television. You know. I think people would be more interested in actually seeing things at work. You know. And on the, the subject of sugar, um, you know, one early sugar confection, of course, in this country were suckets, which were preserved peels. And you can see here a variety. There's a citron there, a cedro, hidden away under bitter oranges, lemons. And these are um, candied almonds in the full sheath, you know, when they're on the tree. You see them in Spain and Italy, but we used to make them here too. And that's what you ate them with. Uh, this is a socket fork. That's a silver one. There's lots of silver ones because they were very posh. But the, the last object I'm going to pass around, don't steal it please, one of my favourite things, is actually a very low status socket for, because it's made of something called latin, which is a, a copper alloy, and it had previously been tinned, but it's been buried in the ground. And you ate your sticky bit with the fork, and you drank the syrup with the liquid. I mean, anything to do with confectionery has always fascinated me. And um, one of my favorite tools, I haven't brought it along because I've got about 15 of them. I've got a whole set of Renaissance wafering irons from about 1400 all the way through to the 1700s. And um, they're so heavy, I, I can never struggle all the way from Cumbria. But what you can make with them are these most just delightful looking wafers, you know, with these extraordinary, beautiful kind of Baroque patterns on them. And this was a thing that you always had at the end of the meal, usually with a glass of spiced wine, um, as a kind of echo of the Eucharistic thanksgiving at the end of the meal. So I thought it would be appropriate to have a little quasi-religious uh, moment where you can see some wafers, although unfortunately you can't taste any of these things. But what's been great is Hattie's rallied all of you people to provide what was actually a lovely um, panoply of historical dishes earlier on. And so I'm going to say thank you. And um, I don't know whether the Guildhall Library wants to kick us out fairly soon, but I'm going to shut up now. And, uh, <laughs> Not going to let you get, get away. Yeah. Um, we're here until until nine. It's the very latest. We need to go. And so, um, could, could we ask you some questions? Absolutely, it's always the best bit. As far after as a while, concerned. we can go and drift off and have another glass. But yeah. questions, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. would be great. Certainly. Would you like to chair this, actually, so that yes, you know? Yes. Um, <laughs>
is, uh, is the word griddle a perversion of griddle? Yes. Exactly. It's a, the same root word, yeah. It's exactly the same thing, yeah. I've got a question about how you make your amazing glowing fire. Are they cold or wood? <laughs> oh, well, they vary. I mean, I use all fuels. I live in a part of the world where, at one time, if you didn't have a great deal of money, your, your main fuel was turf or peat, you know, which you cut from the bogs and dried out. And um, that was very much a subsistence fuel in the more sort of marginal areas, particularly of the north. And it's very slow burning. So you can't roast in front of turf, but you can cook slow stews and things. So the kind of traditional skinks and stews of Ireland and Scotland were defined by the fuel that most people could afford. You know? So I, I burn it sometimes. I actually also use it to smoke fish with rather than wood, you know. Um, but I burn wood um, every now and then, and three times in my life, and possibly again next year, I've roasted a full ox in front of, you know, a fire 29 hours to roast it, using seven tons of birch and well-seasoned ash. Um, so, you know, they, they understood fuels, but of course, you know, the, 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 the thing that revolutionized food in this country was the fact that was sitting on a huge pile of high-grade coal. Mm. And during the 17th century, the hearth started to change because, especially in areas near where you could source it, um, and it has to be raised up because you have to have an underdraft. So if people started cooking using coal. Um, it's not very good for cooking over, you know, it's not much good for using a, 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 a griddle over because it will, it will actually flavor the food very unpleasantly. But the, the kilowatt hours you get thrown out from coal means it turned out to be, actually strangely enough, the best fuel for roasting in front of. And this was used in France as well, particularly in northern France and in Parisian hotels in the 19th century. It seems counterintuitive because you think, oh, no, the food is going to taste awful, but you're roasting meat three feet in front of the fire sometimes. You know, this whole thing about bringing it in close and getting a nice kind of crust on it and then moving it away is not right. They didn't do that. Um, doing it, you discover that the nuances are quite extraordinary, and a lot of understanding of fires and you know their alchemy and how they pushed out heat and the best parts of you know, for instance, when you put a piece of um, meat in front of a fire and it's a big joint, you'll find that the middle cooks first because the radiant heat comes in straight lines. The further out you get, you know, it's often <coughs> if it's going beyond the the width of the fireplace, it won't cook very well. Um, so for instance, when you cooked a, a pig, you know, a little suckling pig, and they didn't cook big pigs actually, they tended to cook small ones, you actually had to put something between the fire and the pig to cover up its middle. It was called a pig iron, and you hung it on the grate, and it stopped the heat from hitting the middle of the pig. So it cooked the extremities, which took a longer time to cook. And then when they were getting on well, you'd remove it, and then it would cook the middle, which would cook more quickly. Um, so, tremendous amount of understanding of fuels. But I use everything. And because I live in the north of England, I mean, I have, I have a range which was designed to burn coal, but they also burn coke, which is a better fuel because there's no fumes off it. And also, it, it burns at an amazingly high temperature. And charcoal too. So you know, all these fuels are really, really important. Sorry, long-winded answer. No, 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 no. Yes. Um, going back to your huge sugar sort of Pierce Monte, would, would you say that developed from a sort of political, from a political? Totally, totally. Yeah. I mean, um, in the medieval period, and a lot of people now just forget how religious people were. And a lot of the meal was a bit like a high mass. It was like a ritual ceremony with washing of hands and grace being said. And a lot of the sculpture that was made out of edible materials or inedible, often they use wax, and brought in in between the courses, as in the French and English tradition, or in Italy often you had extraordinary sugar sculptures, you know, all the way down the middle of the, of the table. They always had a program. You know, that they weren't just decorative at all. That happens in the 19th century, but they always had a program, so they have some political intent. I mean, my favorite one is, is a, um, a subtlety, which is the kind of medieval name for a pièce montée, 
which was put before the eight-year-old um, Henry VI in 1629, sorry, in, um, in 1429 in Westminster Hall. And it was a sculpture which showed the Madonna and Child, Saint Denis on one side, Saint George on the other side, and the little eight-year-old boy kneeling with a sonnet by the, the John Dryden, who was the, um, the laureate, and it, the, the poem says, um, you know, Madonna and child, you know, blessed Mary, mother dear, um, I claim to be the king of England, St. George, and of France, do you agree with me, you know? And wow. his father had won the Bat de la Mangin Corps, and on the table is this thing, we've actually made things like this, um, which is basically a pretty crude political statement, you know, of kind of territorial intent. And, um, but a lot of them are religious, you know, a lot of them are very religious. And um, we've got a few surviving late medieval moulds. There's one in the, um, in the Museum of London, which shows a figure of probably uh, St. Catherine of Siena, um, which is definitely a sugar. Um, so often the meaning is tied up with all sorts of events that have long been forgotten about. Yeah. Whereas in the 19th century, I mean, there's an amazing photograph I've got of a, a 1900s London omnibus made out of sugar. That's purely fun. But earlier on, they were quite serious. And sure, that one, if we go back to it, I think you're talking about that. Yeah. Okay, uh, this was designed by a French, um, well, he illustrates, a man called Menon, who wrote a lot of books in the middle of the 18th century. And um, this figure here is Circe from um, Homer's, you know, Iliad. And she's turning, um, Odysseus's men into swine, um, which is a kind of allegory of greed. So you've got a group of very learned kind of, you know, French aristocrats have all had a kind of classical education. They've just stuffed themselves with an enormous amount of food, and then they start discussing the centerpiece, and they realise it's taking the piss out of them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not talking into the microphone. Um, Sorry, are there any other questions? Well, you have to remember that it was not only just made in households, in farmhouses, but also by professionals. And uh, they needed to be fully kitted out. And they're very specific. I mean, I, the, I showed you the tip of the iceberg, you know. Mm -hmm. I've got a thing called a have a cake scraper, which is for making a special type of have a cake called scrape cake. And it's a squeegee. It's a bit like a squeegee, but with two little nails sticking out just a tiny bit. So you get your dollop of the batter, which is a leavened one. It's bubbling with yeast. And you, you hurl it on to your, um, your backstian. And then you pull the squeegee along like that and it makes it perfectly the same thickness all the way along it. It's about that long, you get a great big long thing like that. And uh, it's a very simple thing, it works absolutely brilliantly. And it means you can make these long oval ones, um, which are full of bubbles. They look like very thin crumpets, and they were best eaten soft. But that's scrape cake, and that is such a specific thing that you can knock one together in five minutes with a bit of wood and a couple of nails. So some of that equipment is, is quite simple. There are hundreds and hundreds of surviving have-a-cake maidens, you know, these easels. They were sometimes made from wood. I showed you one there that was also made out of wrought iron. And um, they, they, you could do toast on them as well if you wanted. You know, they, they, they could be utilized to make something else. The, the, the have-a-cake rollers, um, they did other things with those, for sure, because um, there, was, there was a type of biscuit that was also made which had that pattern on it. Um, so, yeah, but in the, in, in the main, they were the specialist tools of a very kind of particular craft, really. Um, of course, the main thing, the backstian or the girdle, could be used for making hundreds of things. And, of course, you know, everything from drop scones to girdle scones, um, which you still can buy in some Scottish bakeries. Um, and of course, you have to remember that people who didn't have ovens, the only way they could often cook cakes was over the fire. And for instance, why is a Chorley cake or an Eccles cake 
or a Banbury cake, so thin, because originally it was almost certainly made as a hearth cake. You know, two sheets of pastry, something sandwiched in between, and then cooked on the girdle. Um, so, you know, that they were used to make yannex, bannex, all sorts of flatbreads. And because we no longer really cook over the coals or over peat, peat is the best fuel for making those things. And a lot of, in the Lake District, we had, I think, 3,000 mills in the Lake District, water mills. Some of them were turning bobbins for the Lancashire cotton industry. And people used to go along and scrounge all of the, all of the, the turnings. So they'd, they'd use the turnings from the mill to cook, cook their haver cake with, or their yannex or their bannex or their other flatbreads. And the English, and I mean the Scottish flatbread tradition is mainly now, mainly little commercially made oat cakes. Um, in Lancashire, the wonderful oat cake tradition is practically, well it has died. In Yorkshire, it's practically gone. In Derbyshire, it's still alive, but it's a bit different. It's more like a pancake. And in Staffordshire, it's really alive. That's where you get some most extraordinary things. Um, but they're a ghost of their former self, really, because a lot of them were made by professionals, especially in mill towns. People didn't have the time or the equipment, so they'd go to the shop and buy them. And a lot of the kit that I showed you was probably from professional makers rather than domestic people who did it as a you know a daily chore but you know do you know about the the have a the, the have a cake hurling machine at all <laughs> okay, right. um there was a there was a machine that was invented to speed this process up and it made soft oat cakes and what you did you filled a hopper full of batter which is a mixture of water oat very fine oatmeal and yeast and salt and you let it ferment and then the hopper had a regulator which would allow a, an absolute perfect standard amount to drip out every five seconds. And it dripped it out onto a conveyor belt made of canvas, which moved along, and it vibrated as it went along. And it was automatically dusted with oatmeal, so they didn't stick to the conveyor belt. So you are a big blob of, um, let's say, have a cake batter, and you suddenly find yourself falling out of the hopper onto the belt, which is going along like this, and you are kind of spreading out as you kind of vibrate. And then you're going along, and suddenly you realize actually you're coming to a cliff edge, you know, because the belt goes that way. And when you get to the cliff edge, a little flipper comes up and flicks you, and you go flying through the air like this, and you splat into a vertical sheet of iron, which is heated. And you stick to it like that, thing, oh my god. And then as it gets really hot, you cook, and you fall off into a basket below, you know. <laughs> and someone was actually using that until the 1960s in, in a Yorkshire town. And people used to go along to the bakery, they couldn't believe this thing. It was absolutely amazing, you know. But, you know, the, the guild of, yeah, I think the, you ought to get one for the Guild of Fever. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Orlando. Um, a very quick question. With the, with the roasts at the beginning, you had things tied up. What did you use to tie them up that didn't burn? Well, this is one of the great sort of things that's really interesting, is that people, oh my goodness, the string will burn. It doesn't, actually. Um, they would have probably used hemp or possibly linen thread sometimes, you know, to tie things up. They also, you're often instructed to tie things up with fillet, which was linen tape. Do you know the, the fish that was tied on with fillet? If you baste it, it doesn't burn. In fact, it just doesn't burn. And they used to use paper. You know the gridirons? I didn't show you how they were used. Well, um, in very polite cookery, noble houses, this is an incredibly interesting cultural thing. They didn't like the taste of the fire on the meat. So, you know, if you put something over the barbecue now, we love that kind of, you know, carbony, burnt, greasy flavour, which, you know, is fantastic. But it didn't appeal to very refined tastes. So, I think in Scappy, there is an instruction to make little paper cases to put things like cutlets in. And you put them on the gridiron, and they don't 
they're not cooked in the direct heat of the of the wood or the charcoal and they actually don't have that taste on them because the paper acts as a mask. You get it in even in northern England as well where they did sometimes use coal um, and they'd let the fire die down so there was no tarry fumes coming off and it's really bright. Cool it down a bit, put a gridiron on and make little paper cases to put kippered salmon in. And again, you don't get the flavour of the fire on, on, on the meat. So roasting was the most expensive type of cookery because you've got to make a bonfire. And the expense is not so much the animal, but the fuel. Because you're burning like tons of wood for the course of preparing for a big meal. So roasting is done away. It's not everyone thinks you do it over the flames. That's not what was done at all. They did it in front of the fire. And you get fantastic radiant heat. And it's a clean type of cookery. I remember Heston, you know, he came to me and he said, I haven't, you know, I want to do this roast pineapple he showed me to do, you know, and put it on the menu. And I said, great. And he put it on the menu. And I, I went there, I think, um, with um, Richard Atkinson. Is Richard here? I think he was coming, but maybe he's not. Oh, sorry, Richard. Do you remember that lunch we had with Heston? And they were roasting those pineapples, which they still do there. And, um, Hessen had concocted this amazing thing where he was putting little drops of um, smoke essence in the syrup. And I remember as we left, um, there was um, somebody collecting a very, very expensive looking cashmere coat, you know. And they got it off the thing, I could, they were smelling it, and I walked off down Knightsbridge, you know, with like a thousand pound coat on, going <laughs> like this. Because <laughs> the whole restaurant was permeated with the smell of, and that was wrong in a way, because that that kind of thing was not flavoured with smoke. I'm sorry, Nicola, you have been... Well, just, just absolutely mm. related to what you just said. Um, mm. Could that be why some people used to recommend wrapping venison up in a paste for roasting? Yeah, I mean... And did they do that with other meats as well? Yeah, certainly with venison. Um, what Nicola is talking about, uh, the, the standard way of, of roasting venison was actually a pasty on a spit. You... Um, you put your venison, which are usually larded with back fats, because it's very dry. Um, and you then wrapped paper around it, tied it on with some string or some tape. And then you rolled out a big sheet of, of, of pastry, which didn't have any shortening in it, just hot water and flour. And you wrapped it around the venison. And then you put another sheet of paper around that to hold it all together. And then you stuck it in front of the fire and slowly rotated it. And what actually happens, I've done this a lot, the, the, the venison eventually gets the radiant heat, start, it cooks inside what is a hermetically sealed um, paper and pastry thing. And um, when it is cooked, you, you sort of cut open the pastry and you get a tsunami of the most delicious gravy you've ever had in your life. And the, the, the meat is like marshmallow, you know, it's cooked um, in, a, in a wonderful way. Um, the other dish, which is an unusual one, in which that technique was used, was swan. Um, swan is, uh, well it wasn't really swan, it was cygnet. They didn't eat swans, they, they ate cygnets. I gave a talk earlier in the year about this, but um, they would actually put a sheet of um, back fat over its breast, and then a sheet of paper, because it would dry out very quickly. And of course it was roasted in front of the fire. But even with a big joint of beef, it's got a fat, if you take a sirloin with its bone in, it's got a big sheet of fat around it. <coughs> that burns very quickly. So you use paper again, and you would tie it on, or you would pin it on, and the whiteness of the paper reflects the heat back to the fire, so that the fat doesn't cook too quickly, and it doesn't burn. And then at an appropriate strategic moment, you know, towards the end of cooking, you remove the sheet of paper, and then you, you then brown the fat. And it's these nuanced approaches to, you know, it's a little bit more subtle than barbecue mess, you know. These, these people kind of understood what was their everyday way of cooking, just like you switch your gas cooker on. They, they, they did it as, in such a familiar way that, you know, so... Oh dear. <laughs> well, no, how I got started actually was more pieces, it was books. 
Um, I bought my first antiquarian cookery book when I was 13. Um, while all my friends were listening to the Beatles. And <laughs> I wasn't really into that. I, I was into the fashion of the period. And actually, it's a fashion story. I spent two weeks scraping the barnacles <coughs> off my father's boat and then painting it for him. And he gave me a tenner for two weeks' work, which is quite a lot of money and when I was 13, back in the early 60s. And um, I bought a pair of Levi jeans with the money, <laughs> which cost me £3.99. So I had sort of, you know, six pounds and, you know, one penny left. And um, I went to a boarding school, and we weren't allowed to wear things like jeans at all. They were totally verboten. But I came up with a ruse of a friend who had a pair as well, and we got on a train and went to the next town about 20 miles away, got chained <laughs> on the train, and walked into this unknown town like a couple of real dudes in our new jeans. And it started to rain very heavily. I mean, the, 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 the raindrops were like hundred watt light bulbs. And we very, very quickly got really wet. And we were seeking shelter somewhere. And this changed my life because we, um, we saw a door and ran into it and it was a shop. And it was a, it was a bookshop, it was an antiquarian bookshop. And there was a gentleman in there with some sort of half moon glasses and he was glaring at these two wet schoolboys as if we were devils. He didn't want us. And the shop was pretty high. It's like a Bond Street bookshop. Um, and I realised he didn't want us there, but I thought he's not going to kick me out in the rain. So I pretended to be interested in some books. And I pulled down this beautiful kind of limp vellum binding with wet hands. And I could see these laser beams coming out of his eyes. He wanted to destroy me. So I went over to a little hospital corner where they were rather broken and I picked up a book and it just fell open on a page and the page was to bake a lump. It was a cookery book and underneath it it said to broil a lump, to fry a lump. And I said to my friend, look at this, this is, what's a lump? We were giggling, he came over. And by that time, we'd moved on to even richer kind of uh, parts of the book because I came to the section on, on sucking pig. And of course, this is pre-1800, so the long S, you know, which started <laughs> off there. So you can imagine a couple of giggling schoolboys. And he said, what are you doing? He said, look, I know you've come out of here, out of the rain, so get out of my shop. And I said, no, 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 um, I'm very interested in this. And my dad used to take me to auction. So I said to him, what's the best you can do on this? And it says, it says 15 shillings. I'll give you 12 and 6. And he said, come on then, let me see your money. So I produced this very moist fiver out of my pocket. And he took it and he gave me the change and he said, I'll wrap it up for you. He says, you don't really want this. It's a very expensive way of getting out of the rain. And I said, no, no, I collect them. I lied. <laughs> we went back to school on the train and I forgot to change into my school uniform and realised that when I got off the train I rushed to the toilets on the station, got changed into my school uniform, put my wet jeans into my duffel bag. But somebody, a sneak prefect, who actually looked a little bit like Michael Gove, actually. <laughs> he, he sneaked on us and um, after supper the headmaster called me out and said, Dave Saggers, come to my office. And my friend and I went there. We were interviewed separately. And he said, you were seen wearing non-regulation trousers <laughs> on Ipswich Station. Uh, what have you got to say for yourself? And I said, it wasn't me. No, no, no. It must have been somebody else. And he said, well, we found these in your locker. And it was my wet jeans. And I said, oh, please, what are you going to do with them? And he said, oh, they will be destroyed, he said. So they were incinerated. And I still, I still think this is very unfair. But the, 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 the kind of booby prize I got was the book, because I couldn't put it down. And then when I went home, I had to try out some of these recipes. And that's absolutely true. That's how I got into it, completely and utterly by accident, you know. Uh, come on, we must have you're some of the, the most august food writers in Britain. Come on, do you tell me what a lump is? Somebody must know what a lump is. No? You're roasting it. You're probably... A lump fish? Yes, a lump fish. Well done. And you could be somebody. I think. A lump fish. Yeah. They make a very cheap kind of fake caviar from the road nowadays. You know lump fish? 
Yeah. Well, and then are you competing with other people? Not now, and I had no competition really. Maybe Robin for ice cream equipment, <laughs> you know. Um, but we've always got on together and we don't fight about it. Although, I'd once been down the Portobello Road and I turned up at Robin's house and I bought myself a, an ice cream bowl which was a little boiled potato, a new potato. So he made a, 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 an ice cream out of, you know, or, or sorbet. And I showed it to him and he said, oh, oh, come on, he said. He went to his cupboard and he, I had one about that size, and he came out with this potato. <laughs> and he said, my potato is bigger than your potato. <laughs> um, I think we, well, we can continue next door. I think we need to clear it. Right, quarter past eight. So um, just to say, Thank you yeah. so much, I think that was